So as far as humans know, we have the most advanced theory of mind of any being. We did kind of come up with the term, though. Uh, the idea that other beings have inner lives comparable to our own is the basis for empathy and cooperation and deceit and pretty much everything we associate with being a conscious being living among other conscious beings. We base our whole concept of intelligence on a mind's ability to create an identity and internal awareness of itself as an agent distinct from its surroundings of other creatures. And other creatures. Distinct from its surroundings and other creatures. Yeah. It doesn't make much sense at all to think of awareness without a self. I think experience and awareness are emergent properties of massively integrated computation and memory of environmental data streams conveyed by the senses. These integrations form a simulation space for planning and prediction. The simulation space may form a representation of the entity hosting it and even the simulation itself. These internal representations of the system are the basis for a system's awareness of itself as a distinct self. But what defines the parameters of the self the computational system identifies? Well, a mirror test can supposedly demonstrate an animal's capacity to visually distinguish itself from another animal. And it's a fair assumption that any animal with this capacity makes the distinction of their self as their physical body. A human, a human body is a distinct unit. Like, like all other bodies that support minds, we identify as comparable to ours. Even a cephalopod, which is probably the most alien intelligence for our own that we can still recognize as intelligent, is clearly built on a distinct individual body unit, just like us. The self is its separation from its environment. The boundaries of a self are the boundaries between the supporting computational system and the environment in our ex <coughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, in our experience, these boundaries are clearly associated with a unit body. The value of this arrangement is obviously survival of the system that supports the self. The self's ability to distinguish itself from its environment is what allows it to plan and interact with it in complex ways. The capacity for c complex interaction is necessary when there are multiple individual body units competing for and utilizing one another as resources. Uh, predation may be the initial catalyst for more advanced forms of self-awareness in both predators and prey species. When one being must consume and destroy another to survive, it's to both's advantage to be pretty clear about one where, where one creature ends and the other begins. Both predators and prey have an incentive to predict one another's behavior. The more sophisticated a mind each has, the more accurate and useful their predictions and behavioral reactions become. Predation requires a clear understanding of the boundaries of the structure supporting each self, but does not require a strong consideration of what lies inside those boundaries or another creature's mind. But as predation and competition for resources becomes more sophisticated, a more advanced theory of mind becomes useful for purposes of deception. Deception itself does not require a mind at all. Evolution fabricates deceptions for microscopic creatures with no discernible mind at all. But reactive behavioral deception seems to indicate a more refined understanding of the self to include awareness of the state and intents of other minds. To actively deceive requires awareness of another creature's expected reaction to a given stimulus, stimulus and manipulating that stimulus to affect a more advantageous outcome from that behavior. And the simplest deception is hiding, but it probably doesn't require any real awareness of the fact that a predator cannot see you, it has less chance of eating you. It's probably parallel to simple avoidance behaviors that are universally effective. Deceptive deception behaviors are often uh, very low-risk survival strategies, strategies so it stands to reason that uh, the more advanced the creature, creature's mind becomes, the greater the advantages of active deception becomes. A squirrel that knows it's being observed may fake burying nuts in various locations. Of course, we cannot say with certainty what the squirrel understands about what it's doing or why. We just know squirrels do that sometimes, and apparently it works to some degree, or they probably wouldn't have evolved the instinct to bother. 
but even absent any metacognitive awareness of its awareness of other awarenesses, it seems arrogant not to give the squirrel credit for at least understanding or experiencing that things that watch me take my stuff and altering its behavior accordingly. That's enough for me to give it the distinction of having at least a proto-awareness of self that I can extrapolate as having the potential to evolve something as complicated as my own. <clears throat> Deception and empathy are both potential paths to more advanced theories of mind. Empathy facilitates a more cooperative interactions, but has essentially the same computational requirements as deception. Both require a creature's simulations to include constructs for individual beings other than itself, and to maintain historical state and intent data for each. The advantages of empathy are generally limited to interactions with one's own species, whereas the advantages of deception extend beyond the species. And while empathy may ultimately serve to advance a creature's self-awareness and theory of mind far beyond what deception can achieve, I think it's possible that evolution of the capacity for deception is a necessary prerequisite for empathy. So what survival strategy better incentivizes the development of self that includes awareness of other selves than deception? What other basic survival advantage would understanding the state and intent of another creature's mind grant? The capacity to predict and plan behaviors in response to stimulus quickly reaches a point of diminishing returns against environmental pressures that are totally transparent. Both utilizing deception and defending against it are catalysts for more advanced understanding of distinct selves. So that's the basis for the question. Is deception the origin of self? I'm sure I'm missing a lot, but it seems like an interesting question with a lot of interesting implications. Also, it's got a ring to it. I don't think there's an answer. I, I'm not sure how you go about proving a causal link between the survival ability of behavioral deception and the emergence of complex self-awareness. But the question has been asked, so I figure, why not take the next step? So what if it is? Well, I don't, I don't think it really changes much. I'm not even, it's not even that useful a question and probably a little misleading without deeper context, but I'm not sure how else to phrase it in a short sentence. Maybe it, it gives a little more definition to the ancient wisdom that Atman equals Brahman. I take the perspective that mind is like a flame. A mind is like a flame in that it's just a phenomenon that manifests in given conditions. Its uniqueness is entirely in its initial conditions and environment, but it's the same phenomenon as every other flame. So I think there is only one mind in the universe is wholly correct. There is still only one mind of the universe, and our individual experience of it is defined by the construct of a self that experiences and is aware of its own internal simulations. Nothing that new there, really. What, what you do with that in terms of morality or whatever is pretty wide open. I guess it feels somehow profound that our minds might be intrinsically separate and alone, with no possible structure to enable true union of mind beyond external communication with beings we presume have similar minds but can never confirm, that it might somehow explain unrequitable spiritual longing for unity and universal understanding, but I think that's kind of pointless and anthropic. To me, the idea that deception is the origin of self raises a much more interesting question. Predation and deception are not universal strategies for life even on Earth, and given the expansive potential of life in the universe, might systems capable of thought develop from other pressures that might give rise to an intelligence or awareness without a self? How could that evolve or exist at all? And how might we characterize its qualia of, con of consciousness? The obviously, uh, this, this obviously challenges the limits of human imagination, and I might be fooling myself that a mind built on a self could even comprehend the nature of a mind without a self, but here I go. The mechanics and development of such a mind require looser parameters for what constitutes a being or even thought. Animal nervous systems are extremely well-defined computational and sensory structures. 
It's difficult to imagine analogous internal states of thought emerging from a more distributed living system with no apparent exec executive control. I don't think the states of thought between a, a self-mind and a non-self-mind would be analogous, but I do think there would still be a capacity, could still be a capacity for a kind of thought, or at least an experience, which could give rise to thoughts. If a system can sense its environment, integrate sensory information with memory of previous sense information, and physically alter itself or its environment based on that integration, I think it satisfies the basic requirements to have experience, some, some qualia of experience. But we, we wouldn't be looking for distinct individual creatures as we're familiar with them. I think the most likely place to find a non-self mind would be far more complex living structures such as an entire ecosystem or colony or maybe a hive structure. The mechanisms that provide the sense, integration, and memory functions may be difficult to identify, but they exist in various forms throughout the universe, especially if we stretch to the largest and smallest scales of time and space. A dense, ancient forest watched over centuries takes on extremely complicated changes that could arguably called, be called behaviors and responses. Interactions between species may constitute integration of different sensory inputs. Subtle evolution of creatures within the forest microbiome may constitute a form of long-term memory. We can imagine analogs of living structures with convec within convection cells in a star or crystal growth that modifies its, its own electrical properties to improve self-replication in, in a dynamic environment. Even as we call them analogs of life, we are reluctant to ascribe the property of thought or even behavior to these kinds of systems. They are so radically different from anything we identify as possessing those capacities. The absence of hierarchy or executive control mechanism seems to imply the absence of will or internal experience. It's hard to imagine such a system having the same active internal simulation space that it could use to predict or plan behaviors. But are such simulation spaces truly, ne simulation spaces truly necessary for all forms of thought or just for self-aware metacognition? I should probably use the term experience more than thought to describe a, a non-self mind, though I wonder if that's a distinction without a difference in the context of a discussion about a mind without a self. It seems to me a mind without a self would experience thought more seamless, seamlessly than, an, than a human or animal mind even. Metacognition allows us to step outside of our experience of thought, but it is what creates the apparent distinction between thought and experience. Without a self, there may be no distinction to make. Does that mean that a non-self mind is incapable of any kind of metacognition? Maybe, or just maybe only as we know it. This is probably the edge of my imagination. I can't even approach how a non-self mind might come to be aware of thought without having a self to be aware of. But I don't think that means something like it is impossible. So if there are other minds that exist without a self, how might we interact with or observe them? Well, that's, that's the rub. We can't do either, ever. It's, it's trying to multiply a number of, in a letter. It, it doesn't even make sense. A non-self mind cannot fully distinguish, just distinguish me as not itself, and I cannot even recognize a being that doesn't have an easily definable unit body to interact with. Non-self entities may not have anything resembling language or communication, symbolic communication at all. It seems like it would, it would be a kind of pure thought that would have no need for symbolic expression. If there are such minds in the universe, they may be all around us, but they would be so fundamentally incompatible with our own that we appear to them as nature appears to us, just mindless forces and phenomenon. But... Also, for practical purposes, we are simply too small and short-lived. Uh, the minds I'm imagining would most likely exist on geologic or planetary timescales and over expansive areas. The evolution of self-based intelligent agency can be catalyzed by biological evolution and predation, which are relatively rapid, violently iterative processes. A mind that emerged from forces other than individual survival would likely develop slowly, with no iteration. Only a smooth, fl smooth flow of experience from the simplest correlation of sensory inputs, maybe all the way to pondering kooky 
thoughts about the possibility of minds that are distinct and separate from one another. Or maybe this is all just plain wrong and the self really is the origin of awareness and there could be no awareness without self. Maybe self is as simple as the simulation have a sim having a symbol for itself and all simulations do that eventually. Maybe any being that I'm thinking of not having a self actually would have a self. It would just be so vast and alien that I'm calling it something else. But it's really just a giant self. Or maybe not. Maybe not even that. Maybe you really do need a tightly integrated system with well-defined executive control for anything resembling a mind to emerge. Maybe whatever. But it's fun to think about other kinds of minds for a while, and so I did that with mine.